Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sherlock Conversations. My name is Don Smith, and I am your host. This is really cool because I have a uh, we have a rare treat today. I am a big fan of uncovering aspects of Sherlock Holmes that people have been written that have people have written about uh, and coming at it from diff different angles. And this is probably one of the most unique, if not the uniquest book that I have encountered about Sherlock Holmes. And I'm going to have a picture of it when, when we uh, do this. It's called A Sherlock Holmes Devotional Uncovering the Mysteries of God. And it's written by Tricia White Preby. And Miss Preby has, is not exactly, um, her, her writing credentials is pretty high up there in the literary world. She uh, works with a gentleman by the name of Jerry B. Jenkins, who basically put Christian fiction on the map with his Left Behind series that he wrote with, and his name just slips my mind, and uh, Tim LaHaye. And uh, it was all about uh, the Christian rapture. If you, uh, to get slightly theological, if you are a, into belief in es eschatology and have an understanding of it, basically it is the belief that uh, the Christian church will be raptured before the rise of the Antichrist and the tribulation. And, um, and basically their book series is a combination of of Tom Clancy with a little bit of Joel Rosenberg mixed in between and thrown upside down. And um, Trisha, I didn't mean to go so long about talking about that, but you have some pretty, pretty, pretty high literary credentials there. That's got to be pretty impressive. Well, thanks. It's fun. Um, I kind of, it's a funny story how I stumbled into that opportunity, but i um, really thankful for it. I've learned a lot from uh, Jerry and um, wouldn't trade any of it for anything. So, yeah, thanks for those kind words. Oh, no. And also, um, your Sherlock Holmes devotional is a lot of fun. Um, my issue with books like these is, is that like they'll do like Christian versions of like the gospel according to pick whatever pop culture person that you can and it seems like they just stretch it for miles to try and get everything they possibly can this one I don't get that feeling at all like I really genuinely felt like I mean like I'm sure you had to at some point going okay I need about 30 of the 30 more of these things and I've got maybe 15 ideas let's do a little bit more reading but I really got the I got these devotionals as like they came from the heart and I was really impressed with that I appreciate that I'm glad that came through and I wasn't sure when you said that about the needing 15 more if I had accidentally left that in the manuscript or uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's good. it was fun to read all of the stories and the novels um, essentially the full canon I read again over the course of putting this together and that was a fun experience right I actually quoted you today I did this um, I did this in um, an interview that I had you're actually my second Sherlock writer I interviewed today and the first one was screenwriter Bonnie McBird, and uh, you, you've you got some pretty good company for you today. Hey, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and I said to her, I go, one of my favorite quotes in the book is, you said, read the canon twice. First time, read it for the adventures. Second time, read it for the friendship between Watson and Holmes. Yes, yes. Very few friendships have been written as beautifully, I think, and as um, just all the layers, you know? Sometimes yeah. I think in our, our books or movies, our relationships are very one-dimensional, and I feel like uh, ahead of his time, um, Doyle was able to really um, hone in on some of the things that make friendship what they are. You know, the, the annoyance, the loyalty, the um, frustration, the forgiveness, the love, you know? So I love how um, deep you went with that relationship. Yeah. One of the things that I like about this relationship is, is that, um, not to go too far down this path, but um, everybody twists everything, if you catch my drift, um, is 
like you, you'll see it all the time in the Cumberbatch series where Watson's constantly going, Holmes and I are not dating. And yeah. when you read the books, you don't get the slightest, like you get that this is pure friendship. The only thing that um, Holmes wants from Watson is um, a friend there that he can bounce ideas off of him. And then eventually Holmes grows to really regard him as a friend. And Watson is not only enamored with this more cosmopolitan or this more adventurous cosmopolitan friend, but he's very, um, he's very, like, he takes it very, like, he is really, really very, like, like, he's, he views him more than that. He begins to see past the adventurer as the real person that he is. Like, this is a man that, um, he probably doesn't have romantic entanglements because they would probably be too hard for him. And, and Holmes has got to keep himself very focused on his work, and so he just doesn't get involved with friendships and the like. Sure, I would agree with that. And I do think in our representation of Sherlock series on TV, I think maybe even some of those elements, like the jokes about the dating, are almost meant to be more culturally relevant topics and conversations than maybe the original manuscript intended, for sure. Right, right. Because they, they just didn't talk like they just didn't talk about things like that. I mean like if they did, it was really strongly implied. Um, it was, it, but it, but people didn't come right out and say it. Like in Dracula, there is um, obviously a very, very strong um, sexual element with Mary Harker and Dracula at the end of the book. But it wasn't like a, let's get gratuitous like it was a har har Harlequin romance. And in a way, I kind of like that because it takes that aspect out of it, and it's kind of like. All right, with Sherlock, we can leave all of the extra stuff. Where I mean, like, it's kind of like the joke in horror movies and um, and in action movies. It's like I'm running away from this thing that's carrying a chack, uh, that's carrying a chainsaw. Wait, why don't me and this girl stop going to a hotel room, have a romantic encounter? <laughs> and it just kind of takes you away from that. Whereas in the Holmes Watson relationship, it's all friendship, and it's just straightforward. Yes, I would agree with that, hundred percent. Right. So, um, oh, and this is before I uh, before we started the interview. I found it, and then this is from my friend Pastor Mary, who gave this to me. I'm going to see if I can try it one more time. Show you the note that she says, and it says, "May this help you detect God's blessing for you, Pastor Mary." That's neat. I like the way she worded that. Yeah. How did, can, let me ask, because, like, you're writing something that is all about, um, like, obviously, like, um, I don't normally talk about my faith and my religion in my uh, Sherlock conversations, but this time I am because of how great this book is and because it's it means something. In the Sherlock Holmes devotional, I got the feeling you wrote this for Christians, but also at the same time, there is a wide berth for people that are not from a Christian perspective. And what I liked about it was, there was no, you're a sinner, let me beat you over the head with this. It was just this very straightforward, like, hey, you know what, let's leave the sin and stuff off to the side, do you know that God loves you? And then, when you know God loves you, let you and God work out the sin part. Can I ask, is that the perspective you came from almost? I don't know that I thought of that specifically as I was writing, but I would say that is kind of how I um, have conversations about my husband is actually um, in full-time ministry. And um, I believe, like when you look at stories in the Bible, say um, where Jesus sits down with the woman at the well, uh -huh. um, but he talks to her is very much, and even when he talks to Nicodemus, a man who is um, not a believer, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't see Jesus, who essentially would have all authority, right, to beat you over the head for sin. You don't see him interact with people that way. You see him very much the way you're talking about. Let's start at a point of love and make it clear that um, that is the primary thing, and then um, we go from there. And um, so... No, I'm glad you picked up on that. I'm glad that's your perspective because I do not think Christian writing that pounds somebody over the head is effective writing. Yeah. Um, 
Nobody likes to be pounded over the head, and you're not going to turn the page if you feel pounded over the head. So I'm glad that was, I'm glad that's how you felt. Yeah, um, yeah because what this reminded me of, let me put it this way. Um, there, this is the sort of book that, because like the devotional, like, obviously you do kind of touch on theology, and to kind of sum up every passage, it's, hey, God loves you. Nah, all right. Like, hey, look at this aspect of Sherlock, and then we can turn it this way. God loves you. And um, what is great about a book like this is this would be the sort of book I would give to a friend that's going through a really hard time. Like, it almost, I would almost compare it to a Max Lucado book uh, or Lucado. You say Lucado, I say Lucado. Let's call the whole thing off. Yes. Um, because, like, the thing is, is that, like, not to knock somebody like C.S. Lewis, but if you experience say a really terrible loss in life I'm not the type to give them a C.S. Lewis book which is heavy in theology heavy as into here's why people die because of this dark world and and the apologetic aspect of it whereas Max Lucado was very much like I would compare Max Lucado to that blanket you would give to somebody that you see who is watching their house burn up immediately after and yeah. that's how I would classify this book as well. Where it's kind of like, I have no idea what in the world is going to happen in my life. And I just need some instant comfort. Here, sure. have this. Well, thank and, you. And, yeah. and, and I wondered if you can talk a little bit about that. Type. Did you catch the differences that I mean with kind of sticking somebody with heavy theology versus let me just be a friend type of thing? Sure. You know, I think one of the things that lent itself naturally to that is that um, Arthur Conan Doyle, Conan Doyle, however you want to say it, <laughs> um, he did not um, pretend to be a theologian. He did not pretend to um, study the deep things of faith. Um, and so I think to try to extrapolate from his writing you know, deep faith or deep theology would have been a mistake. Right. Um, I think certainly if I were going to write a book on C.S. Lewis, say, or a book on, you know, some of these other well-known yeah, like, theologians, it would be, maybe it would feel wrong for me to, to write on those individuals and come away feeling like it was, you know, love or light. Um, but I felt, I felt like with Sherlock Holmes, um, that was the right approach because mm. that, that, you know, that's kind of natural to the things that were important to him. So, um, yeah, no, I'm glad you felt that way though. And it's funny you said that because I have two little boys and I left them to come over here for this um, discussion and oh, they're reading you. a book by, um, uh, Max Lucado. As we speak, they were looking at a hardcover book that he wrote. <laughs> that was, that's really funny that you said that, but, uh, that's yeah. awesome. Now, you wrote this book back in 2015. How did how did this happen? Because it's published by um, it's published by Shiloh Run Press, which is an imprint of uh, Barber Publishing. Yeah. How did you get the opportunity for that? Yes, it was really cool because okay, so uh, just a uh, one or two extra sentences to lead into that. Um, my mom spent her entire career as an English teacher, literary teacher, uh, literature, grammar, all of that. But my dad is a scientist. And so it's kind of funny. I grew up with um, a lot. We used to read a lot of the classics in the summer. Or my mom would read to us. And so Sherlock Holmes was just kind of a natural, you know. Of course. <laughs> Both enjoyed um, Sherlock Holmes. Okay, so um, I have a literary agent. And if I remember the story correctly, she actually came to me and said that this particular publisher was looking for someone with a decent knowledge of uh, Sherlock Holmes. I was doing editing work for this house at the time and um, received an email that just basically said, you know, do you know of anybody? Are you interested? And I jumped on it because Sherlock Holmes has always been a favorite. Uh -huh. and so it just kind of went from there, which is funny because the rest of my writing career, I feel like I've chased after opportunities and begged and pleaded, you know, and sent blood. No, not really. But 
<laughs> you are a writer. We, 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 we bleed commonly. Yep, that's how we do it, and we do it for free, so. And so with this one, it was neat because it kind of came knocking at my door, and I was thankful for that opportunity. And it kind of corresponded, if I remember correctly, um, with the Sherlock Holmes TV show starting to gain popularity and come out, and um, it just seemed like the right time and the right fit. Oh, that's great. And um, have you gotten many responses from, like, have the other Sherlock fran fans talked to you about it? Or have uh, other um, yeah. Sherlock fans? Yes, it's funny that you say that. Um, a couple things. First of all, I was surprised that this book, the, the audience was interesting because... Um, you know, a lot of readers, they read simply because they love to read or they find an author that they want to read. With Sherlock Holmes, a lot of times you find people who love Sherlock Holmes who read your book, who may not read anything else you've written. Right. And that's been fun to talk to, to totally new people who may never read my stuff again, and that's fine. But um, loved meeting that. I think also um, some of my favorite conversations, believe it or not, have been with like middle-aged or um you know high school boys who love sherlock holmes and have very strong opinions oh, about nice. this so and i love it i love when people come and say you know you talked about this and and i would have done this or i i think maybe this is a little off or like i welcome that i feel like that's one of the great um fun privileges of literature is kind of trying to discern what the author had in mind and and even how it affects you and how that story lives on, in the theater of your mind right and that yeah that's been fun to talk to people about it and people typically have very strong opinions either way and that's good so. right right so if somebody were to make a comment like one of your devotionals was about a maid needing justice and they pointed out to hey she did get justice in the end uh you wouldn't have minded that comment no matter how good looking the guy was that offered it to you i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> oh actually that yeah that's completely um Yes, I was, I'm thankful for that. I, think it's good. <laughs> I would take it from the perspective of that mean like it reminds me of the old Harlan Ellison comment about how somebody gave him a copy of one of his novels. It was like a paperback version of one of his novels and that book looked like it went through the ringer. And he was thrilled to death with it because he goes, you know what this means? It means people are reading the thing. So I had, it's funny. I had a high school boy um, come up to me to talk to me about the book, and I could see, you know, his parents were there and they're proud of him and whatever. And I, you know, he's telling me how much he enjoys it. And he said, "We keep your book in our bathroom." And at that moment, like I saw the mom's face just go completely white. Like that was not what she wanted him to say. But I thought, hey, if there's a book in your bathroom, you're reading it. Like we don't keep books in there. Like your library is yeah. filled with books you don't read. That was like the greatest compliment ever. Yeah, exactly. And to be honest with you, um, you're a writer. How many times have you gotten inspiration sitting on the toilet or standing in the shower? probably more than I will admit but right. yes exactly they're because there's there 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 and I've actually seriously thought about this is is that when you close that door your body is at complete rest everything about you is I am in a very protected place here and you know what it is it's that all my and I would almost compare it to remember being in grade school you would read a math problem and it would be something like if Bill has five apples and Jane has six apples how many apples do they have all together and you would just sit there just staring at it and it was like I don't understand what I'm looking at it and you call the teacher raise your hand call the teacher over the teacher comes over and it's like your brain has been going for the last two minutes trying to understand five apples, six apples. What does this all mean? Why don't they just make applesauce? Who cares? And then right when the teacher comes over, you know, I can feel safe because the teacher is going to come and help me with the problem. And right when they get there, it's like your brain rela relaxes and then your brain goes, oh yeah, by the way, that's five plus six. That makes, that's one more past 10. So that makes 11. And right when the teacher comes to your desk, you go 11 apples and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. 
and that's and it's the same principle is is that that feeling of safe like i'm gonna get help i don't have to worry now and it's like your brain can relax and um it's like you're sitting there doing what you need to do and then all of a sudden your brain just goes by the way this would make a great story so when you're in that type of position and you're reading a sherlock holmes devotional book and it could be john 3 16 a bible verse every christian has memorized and read a trillion times but before they pass away you're going to all of a sudden have that moment of inspiration on the toilet thinking about a guy in a deer stalker cap and for some reason it's going to go i got it now and i feel encouraged with this situation you know, I hope that happens. I genuinely do. That would be a scenario I never in, never considered, and yet I can't imagine anything better. That's good. Yeah. So from that perspective, this is awesome. I love the fact that I'm talking to a born-again Christian about going to the bathroom and how inspiration hits with that. That is yet to happen in my uh, time. And I've been doing interviews now for two years with the Sherlock Conversation. So this is a first, and I salute you. <laughs> So, so how long did, did, um, so what was the, when you got the devotional, how many devotions did, or how many devotionals did the, um, did they originally request? Like, did they want one to, for like, because I've seen some devotionals go one thought a day for 350 for an entire year, then they got one that's once a week or one for one day a month. How did you guys come up with how many, um, devotionals? If I remember correctly, I think they came to me and asked for 60. And if I remember correctly, they had me um, submit, you know, three or four of them. And they took a look to make sure we're on the same track and we're talking about the same Sherlock Holmes. Right. Uh, I'm sure somebody could say, yes, I love him. And, you know, not really. But um, so... Yeah, I submitted some, and then they gave me the green light, and I got back to them with 60 by whatever that due date was, within whatever word count was decided upon, and um, then the editorial process, of course. Um, you know, somebody going through it, and um, what is it, fine tooth comb <laughs> to make sure details are right, and that, because um, there's a lot. There's a, That was one thing that was important to me, was that I wanted it to be accurate and I wanted it to be filled with Sherlock Holmes. I did not want it to be, here's a book on Sherlock Holmes, we're going to say a couple sentences about it and then primarily it'll just be my thoughts. I wanted it to be very, I wanted it to ring true and authentic to the stories and um, like I said, I spent a lot of time in the canon making sure that I was um, well acquainted with the stories. Anything I could get my hands on that was about the author or any of his works I read, which that was just a fun time anyway. That was something I hadn't really anticipated immersing myself in. Yeah. And, and, and let me just jump in with this. When you go to the end of the book, and by the way, it's okay to go jump to the end of a devotional book first um, because you're not ruining anything. Um, but I got to tell you, listening, looking at your sources, um, this is again not something where you just kind of cracked open a devotional like cracked open a Sherlock book and the, just put a random thought like I'm reading all of the sources that you have like one chapter has two another has four another has three and it's like these are really really in depth You granted Arthur Conan Doyle is in here an awful lot but the thing is, you have a lot of websites. This, like, again, let me just say this. This is not something that was done over a weekend. This was something no. that was really hard and well, and very, very heartfelt. Well, thank you for that. That means a lot that that came through. Um, I, it was a book I was truly sad to finish. Um, that doesn't always happen with manuscripts. But... Um, with this one I was because I felt like um, I did enjoy in fact I would get carried away just you know I'm gonna go research I'm gonna read this story and then four stories later you know probably should yeah. back to what I'm doing but um he is just a very readable author isn't he and he really is which I think is one reason he transcends time because um I think he was saying I'm not gonna get the date right now but it was the you know, 1800s when he was first inspired to write about 
Sherlock Holmes. And here we are, 2017, still talking about it. And yeah. uh, that takes an incredible amount of talent and an incredible ability to zoom in on those areas of the heart and life that don't change. So that we're still, re I mean, many stories certainly have been written in this amount of time by many people that we know nothing about because for whatever reason, um, they didn't have that same ability to speak to people in 2017 that he does. Right. Um, yeah, pretty fantastic, pretty fantastic author. Right, right. Now, from start to um, from start to finish, do you remember when you started the project and about when you finished it? Um, I think if I remember correctly, I finished it. I want to say maybe a, I bet it was about over a six month period that I started and finished it. Um, I, yes, I want to say I finished it in like, um, March, April. And if you back that up, then, um, probably fall, late fall, winter, you know, somewhere in there. Um, yeah, would have been the six months that you would have gotten that yeah and I would think that one of the things that interest that's interesting about this is is that like uh, as opposed to like like it's one thing to write Sherlock as like a pastiche it's another thing to write about Sherlock as a uh, concept and I would think that you would have a uh, not the, I, I would think you would have an easier time doing something like that as opposed to trying to come with with a whole fictional world and everything like that. And it allowed, okay. that is not to say you didn't work hard on that, but I'm just simply. Sure. Um, I have to say, it's funny you mentioned that because there are people who write, I mean, you mentioned Jerry at the beginning of this, who have a talent to write nonfiction and fiction. Um, I find in writing fiction and nonfiction that fiction is tremendously harder. Mm -hmm. Now I don't, I speak for all authors certainly there may be some that totally disagree with that but I find nonfiction I think partially because some decisions have been made for you right, right. so you're not to create or decide I mean there are fewer decisions in some ways um, but you know the the bulk of the research is done for or you know the creation is done for you. you're just researching what was done so um, but yeah I definitely agree with you I think it would be harder to create a fictional and there are, like you know, I'm sure just thousands of stories, novels, um, plays, movies that have um, kind of created their own fictional version of his world. And um, yeah, that would be challenging. Right. Well, but you have written fiction, am I correct? Yes, I have written, I have a series of three books that are novels, yes. What, 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 what would st what would, what's to stop you from doing your own Sherlock pastiche? You like, know, just it's fun. I've never considered it until you're asking me this question. Um, you know, probably the one thing that would hold me back is a little bit of being intimidated by that holy grail of, you know, Sherlock Holmes. I mean, I have no problem writing about it. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I understand. Let me put it this way. I am, when I'm not doing this, one of the things I do, I'm a comic book writer. Awesome. And... If I were given the opportunity to write Superman, I would have a, I would be very, I'd be like, whoa, that's insane. And it would take me a couple of days to wrap my head around it. But if somebody were to give me, hey, how would you like to do a story about a clone of Superman? Where he's basically Superman, but he gets to go in another direction or something like that. I would have an easier time working with that. It, it's yeah. it, there's just something about approaching such a character like that that it's just like whoa like like I don't know if I could write Batman but I could write like say Commissioner Gordon had a nephew that put on the Batman costume for a while I could write that without a prop without a second thought approaching Batman it would be like holy cow like there have been people that have written this like like big, 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 big people that have written this before me. And sure. then I've seen other people. I remember talking with Lindsay Fay, who's a Sherlock pastiche writer, and I asked her, I go, were you ever intimidated by him? And she went, 
no, why should I? And I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> that was like a completely different... Confidence. Yes, that's good. Good for her. <laughs> yeah, so, but then at the same time, I actually did write my own Sherlock pastiche for a, sort, for a series called Beyond Watson, and it was about how, um, but I didn't have to use Dr. Watson as my narrator. I used another guy as a narrator. So it was sort of like I wrote a Sherlock story without writing a Sherlock story, if that makes sense. So it made it a little bit easier type of thing. Yes, even as you said that, I thought, you know, maybe I could write a story where he was the main, you know, or Watson was the main character. For some reason, that feels less intimidating. That's fast. I think on that for a while after this conversation, I'm sure. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, well, because here's the other thing, though. Um... If you do a short, like, you would only have to do a short story. Put it up on your website as a free download, or better yet, put it up on um, Amazon, and people can, hey, for 50 cents, we can read, uh, this lady's written about Sherlock before, for 50 cents, we can read uh, a short story about that and help support her family and her husband's ministry, so. I do it, I will dedicate it to you, how's that? That works, that works, <laughs> so. So, but that that's really cool. So, um, and also, if people want to get a copy of the Sherlock Holmes devotional, where can they, uh, where can they get a, they can get this on Amazon, am I correct? Yeah, they can get it on Amazon. They should still be able to get it through um, really any book retail. I know um, people who have bought it through, you know, Barnes and Noble or just any of, anywhere books are sold typically. So, um, yeah. Very and cool. I, and, and I would um, just say, anybody who does read it, I love um, hearing thoughts. If if anyone, um, you know, listening to this wants to write and say, hey, you know, I don't know that I would have handled number 18 the way you did or what, you know, bring it. I love to talk about it. And um, I welcome conversation about the books and about just the thoughts connected to them. So Gotcha. Now, where, where can people get a hold of you? Because I've seen you on Twitter but then you haven't updated, but then you're not on Twitter, and then you are, then you're not, and then um, I find you on Goodreads and other stuff. I had to call people that I knew. I sent out a couple of carrier pigeons to get a hold of you, so. That is the best way. Funny you mentioned that, carrier pigeons. Please send <laughs> um, No, I actually, I am on Facebook, and I know it's the whole friend request business. I accept friend requests. I probably have tons of spammers. We're good. So if you do ever friend request me, I'm on there and I will accept it. I'm also on Instagram. I don't know if people are. Oh, yes. Um, for some reason, I find Instagram and Facebook to be probably the two places I hang out the most. I am on Goodreads, but um, Twitter is more like the New Year's resolution I make every year and fail. I am still working on that. I need to get better at that. Um, and I have a website, um, it is called Rescuing Sunday, so it's R-E-S-C-U-I-N-G, rescuingsunday.com, um, where I just talk about um, Christian stuff, ministry stuff, um, but I have some contact ability there too, so um, anyway. Very cool. Very cool. Now let me ask you two final Sherlock questions for you. Number one, I'm sure you get this every time you talk to somebody, but who is your favorite Sherlock? Who is my favorite Sherlock? Um, as in my favorite story, or as in... Um, yes, your favorite story and or favorite and favorite actor who played Sherlock. Oh, um, let's see. Okay, so um, my favorite story would be the um, Red-Headed League. Love it. Um, I remember reading that as a kid, and it just kind of feels like putting on a comfortable sweatshirt when I read it. So that's my favorite. Interesting. And, yeah, and then, which I uh, probably should be like The Hound of Baskerville or something, but it's not. Um, then, let's see, my favorite, um, my favorite Sherlock would probably actually be the current one, and now his name escapes me. I'm Benedict sorry. Cumberbatch. Thank you very much. Yes, Benedict Cumberbatch. I don't know. I think he embodies some of that quirky, quiet, um, I don't, something. I, you know, I watched it very skeptically when it first came out and thought, oh, you know, another one. We don't need another one and we don't need a new version. And I don't know. He really brought, I actually thought Watson did a great job on that too. So 
Um, I've watched a lot of the old ones, and I still think um, probably Cumberbatch is my favorite Sherlock at this point. I don't know if that doesn't classic anymore. What What would your answer to that be? About my favorite, uh, you mean my favorite Sherlock story and uh, my favorite actor who played Sherlock? Yes. Um, I go off the beaten trail. My favorite novel, I will flat out say, is Hound of the Baskervilles. I can read that. I can stop what I'm doing and just pick that up at any time and read that. And, um... Because, you are not alone that. That's good. Yeah, because what I also like, the I like the story behind that story. And that was basically Doyle telling people, all right, fine. I will do one more Sherlock story, okay? Then we can let him rest, all right? Okay, you guys good with that? And he was unencumbered when he wrote the story. And and it was very, like, um, very fascinating. And, um, and it was it was really nicely done. It was like it, it was honestly the closest thing to seeing like it was like what as weird as it sounds it was like seeing a reunion tour of your favorite band, um, yeah. and it was and it and it's kind of like okay yeah we haven't got gone together in like seven years and put out a new album type of thing, and we just happened to be jamming one night and then somebody said well why don't we put out a new album and we're like what the heck let's go and tour again and that and we did another comp- not as big as back in the heydays of when we were doing it but we did it and that's what i always liked about it but my favorite short story of his is the yellow face um, really yeah because i love how wrong he was and how quickly he admitted he was wrong about it and I loved how everybody underestimated everybody in that story and and, and I think I think what it was is that um, w- without ruining anything this man comes to Sherlock and says my wife is my wife was married to somebody in the United States he died she moved here we got married and then these people moved to a house on the property and my wife is spending time with them and she's getting really crazy about it and I'm not happy and every time I look up there there's a yellow there's a person with a yellow face and it's really scary looking can you help me out and Sherlock thinks that the wife is being blackmailed so finally in a fit of anger um, the husband not trusting his wife breaks into the house with Sherlock and Watson thinking hey, you know what? We're, we're probably going to go stop somebody from being exploited. The wife freaks out. She's like, oh, no. And it turns out that she had been married to a black man in Georgia, and they had a daughter who is basically a mulatto. And for whatever reason, the daughter had been burned, and she had to wear this special mask to help her out. And the husband comes in, looks down at the girl, and he basically says, he's like, you know what, I may not be the greatest man in the world, but sweetie, I'm better than what you thought I was. And he bent down, and he picked up the girl as if to say, I'm adopting her. This is my daughter now. And he said to his wife, come on. So clearly he was offended by the wife's reaction or what his wife's opinion of him was, but he forgave her. And instead of looking at what was, this is another man's little girl, he said, I'm going to make this girl who is darker skinned in London society. And this showed how forward thinking Doyle was at the time. And he says... Uh, like, like, cause like the idea of a black man marrying a white woman in 1880s, 1890s was scandalous. And he basically says, well, it may have been scandalous. So what? I'm still making this little girl that was the product of that union. We're going to make the two of us We're the two of us are going to, we're, we're, the three of us are going to be a family. And it was like, we're going to forgive each other and we're going to be a family. It was all unspoken context. And then when Holmes walked out of there, Holmes had this big grin on his face and he leaned over to Watson and he says, Watson, I am trusting you. If you ever think I get too, um, basically, uh, to use a Captain Kirk term, too big for my britches, you just lean forward and whisper yellow face or, or there was another word he used for it he's like you just lean forward whisper this and i'll know exactly what you're talking about and then that'll be the end of it 
that's great. You're right about being forward thinking. That's great. Yeah. That's and then to tell you my favorite Sherlock, it was actually uh, Christopher Plummer in um, in um, uh, a murder by decree. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I always, I'm one of these guys that like to go off the beaten trail type of thing. That's good. Yeah, that's, so. That's and good. let me ask this, though. So yeah. wait, there are so many Sherlocks, okay? Yeah. And um, I'll even ask it from two perspectives. What does it say about humanity mm -hmm. that we keep bringing Sherlock back in some shape or form? Like I, right now, we've got about three or four Sherlock's running around. Johnny Lee Miller, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, and um, Ian, Ian, um, oh goodness. I want to say McKellen. That's yes, not right. that's him. Nope, Ian McKellen. Okay. And what does it say about us? You know, it's funny that you ask that because I've asked myself that question. I just read recently, I think we ha our first Sherlock movie is over a hundred years old. Yes. Which really wrap your mind around that. I mean, that's anyway, um, which how many movies do we have that have stuck around, you know, yeah. hundred years or that we're still doing, you know, remakes. And, anyway, um, I think what it says is that somehow that character taps into humanity really well. And I, not only the writing of it, but I remember hearing, um, it's the only interview, is it the only recorded interview? You tell me, that may be way off, but I remember I heard a recorded interview with um, Arthur Conan Doyle, and he said um, that the reason he got into writing um, in the beginning, the reason he created Sherlock, is because he was sick of these mysteries that either were solved because of some um, accident, like, oh, they happened upon the, the answer, you know, just almost um, dumbly, like yeah. fools, or because you found out some new relevant piece of information at the end of the story that really would have been nice to know at the beginning. Right. He felt like as readers, you know, we're being tricked that we should have the information. And I think because of how masterfully he told the stories, which You'll note, like, when you go through his stories, you have all the information you need to solve it. But just like a magician who, he, you know, he's holding the quarter in his hand. And it's not that the quarter really disappears. It's that somehow he distracts you with this shiny information or, you know, whatever. And suddenly you miss the quarter being transferred. Like, I feel like that's the way he told his story so masterfully that we enjoy um, the dissection of it the watching to see him move the quarter from hand to hand and then kicking ourselves that we missed it the first time and I think just the masterful way that um, he you know what made and I'm going to totally jump ship a little bit but what made like um, oh uh, Dr. House remember House yes. the show that's I funny like this is the second time it's popped up today really yeah see I he is just, he's another, he's a quirky well, uh, you, little... Well, if I may jump in, you know that that's where they got the term house from. Had to be, absolutely. Yeah, Ab yeah like any book or encyclopedia about Sherlock Holmes you read today, house is part of that. Wilson is another way of saying Watson. And, how, and they call him house because it sounds like Holmes. Absolutely. I, yes, thank you. And so... I think like what made us love, I mean, what made that show successful? The same things that make, um, and by the way, wasn't, I think that was one of um, Doyle's um, heavy influences was a doctor, right? Dr. Bell. Who used to, yes, who used to be, he didn't ask a bunch of questions. He came in and he observed and came up with a diagnosis based on observation. So I do, I think House is kind of the personification of, Doyle and his writing process and the characters he created. So all that to say, I think he's quirky. I think he's lovable. I think we identify with him in some ways. And I think we're, he's also an enigma. And I think, um, I don't know, he just, he tapped into such a unique way of telling a mystery and um, people love unwrapping the gift of a mystery. And I don't know, it, however it was good for him. And I suspect 
hundred years from now, they're still going to be making movies and spinoffs and, um, yeah. Gotcha. Now, at the risk of sounding like one of Job's friends, <laughs> theologically speaking, do you have an idea as to why maybe the Almighty has allowed for a character like this to have so many incarnations? Fascinating question. Let me think on it for a minute. Um, I think that there are certain lessons to be learned in life, and I think that some stories and storytellers lend themselves to telling stories that resonate in our hearts and minds in unique ways. I, you know, it's he's not Bible, he's not scripture. Right. I don't want to put those, you know, in any way the same plane. And that was actually a concern as I wrote it. I didn't want it to sound as if, you know, the canon and the Bible are the same because they are not in any way. No. And I would say I would agree with that. <laughs> but um, I think some lessons, they're just time tested. They're just lessons to be learned. And I think... Um, especially where humanity is like when you talk you touched on love before i think friendship i think loyalty i think justice i think all these things are time-tested biblical truths um that i don't know they stay with people that's i don't know if no there, that's but. a great answer that's a great answer and that's exactly what it is and it's one of the things that um and, and at the risk of throwing um Christianity, and I'm talking about as a culture, as a pop culture uh, or a subculture, Christianity has a really, really nasty habit of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And they they will basically, like, because I was actually thinking to myself, the churches I would have that I've grown up in would have completely ignored Sherlock Holmes because of uh, Doyle's belief in spirituality and trying to communicate with um, what's on the next level. And, and, and one of the big lessons I've learned in life is you can divorce the art from the artist at times. And it's kind of like also at the same time, just relax. We've got a big God. He's got, he's in, in his, as Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. It's because God doesn't just stick with one design. He's got ways of communicating everything. In fact, one of my favorite quotes of all times is, coincidence is really God working undercover. Because just as we see in the book of the book in the Bible, there are times when God literally steps into frame and says, boom, I'm here, let's deal with this. And then there's other times he takes a back seat and he lets other people deal with it, a la the book of Esther. And even then, same thing. There were times when Jesus, Jesus would stand on the, um, stand in the center of a boat and scream, "Hey, storm, knock it off, be still." And then there's other times he will stand right. Um, he'll stand here and say, "Oh, you know the sick girl that's like 30 miles away? She's okay now." It's it's he has different ways of doing things. So I like to think that God still uses this, and especially he uses this characters like Sherlock to remind us about the better aspects of ourselves and to remind us that there are bigger things that we can strive for as well. And he allows for characters like this. Um, I've actually said to my friends, I mean, Sherlock to me is the closest thing to a religious figure without there being a religious figure. And... And I, and I said, like, I, I actually used the phrase pseudo-religious figure because there are ways that he acted and he would allow certain things into his life and put up boundaries and borders where they didn't need. Like, for instance, if Sherlock were here today, you would ask him, hey, uh, what did you think of uh, Frozen or what did you think of the Twilight books? He'd have no idea what in the world you're talking about. But if you were to say, oh, what do you think of um, using fingerprint powder? Oh, absolutely. He's got an opinion on that. Or what do you think of blood, spl blood splatter? He would have an opinion on that as well. So it's that type of thing. And I think, think what it boils down to is 
the Almighty doesn't just use straightforward uh, preachers, but he uses very subtle ways of reminding us, hi, I'm still here. Let's talk. And to be honest with you, and one of the best places to find them is in a Sherlock devotional by Trisha White Preby. Thank you. So, anyway, Trisha, thank you so much for being here today. It was my it was my privilege, and I'm so thrilled that we had this chance to talk. This is great, and I have a lot of things I want to think about when we hang up, so I appreciate that, too. That's a gift. Very cool. Well, everybody, I'm going to thank you so much for joining us today, and if... Um, and if you guys would like to talk or send us a message about your thoughts on some of the subject matters, we're, we're always open. We're always open to talk because it's not so much that we want to beat people over the head about faith. It's more of a, hey, we found somebody that really cares about you and we just want to share that with the world. And this is one way that I do this. And uh, Miss and Miss Trisha White Preby has found her amazing ways to do that. Also, don't forget to pick up her other books as well. And uh, you can find out all about them on her Facebook site. And she is on Instagram. I just sent sent you a friend request on Facebook. And I just found you on Instagram as well. Awesome. I look forward to that. Thank you so much, Don. And everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. And you have a great day.